Hi, Meredith. How are hey, you? Matt. I'm great. How are you? Oh boy, it's been it's been really busy, but I've been having a blast. Um, awesome. A lot of fun. A lot of projects. Um, just uh, sometimes I, I feel like uh, um, I'm walking on air. Uh, work, work. Although it's hard, it's like you know every day is a new discovery and new people. How about you? I mean, I've, I've I've been watching your YouTube channel and it and it's exploding. It's impressive. What's what's happening out there with you? It's growing. It's growing. I've been working hard too. But as you know, when you're working in your passion and your purpose, it doesn't feel quite like work. Well, you're great. And if people don't know about you, they definitely should know about you. But uh, for those who um, um, have not seen our video that we did, we did a video together. How long ago? Do you remember? It was August. August. So, wow, time flies when you're having fun. <laughs> So we've already done a video together, and uh, and um, and this time it's on gaslighting. When when did when did you first kind of come across this whole gaslighting um, concept? It was probably December, not this past December, but the one before. I read that word, and I, everything started making sense. That's what that is. Wow. Okay. <laughs> Where did, where did you read it? And was it in a book? I don't remember. I'm sure it was online. It was some article that I had found once I started researching narcissistic abuse and found the keyword terms. Then it started popping up, and then I realized it's everywhere. It's in articles everywhere. I was thinking gaslighting. You know, you know, people were using it like it was like some kind of candy term. And then it hit me one day: is that this is a very serious clinical, psychological, um, relational problem. Dr. Martha Stout, the sociopath next door, that's when I really got it. And she, you know, she interviewed a bunch of sociopaths and she discovered they didn't know that term, but they knew exactly what it was. And like they smiled and came alive and they said, that's my favorite trick in the book. It's, it's everywhere. In fact, yeah. um, there was a movie. <laughs> it's funny how once you start doing the research, then um, you realize that, you know, this has been, you know, a lot of these ideas, these thoughts or problems have been around forever. It's just either it, it was under a different name or it just was kind of obscure. Right. And so I did some research and you know the term gaslighting comes from a 1938 play called Gaslight um, and uh, by some English guy. And, uh, and then there was a movie in 1944 with uh, uh, Charles Bo Boyer, I'm probably pronouncing it wrong, Joseph Cotton and Ingrid Bergman. And uh, and it was a really good movie, but it, it, it was all about this phenomenon that we know is gaslighting. It was written two days before she was murdered. Where did you find that? In this score. She must have left it here. It's written by somebody called Sergius Bauer. Give it to me. He said I wasn't any letter. He said I was going out of my mind. You're not going out of your mind. You're slowly and systematically being driven out of your mind. But why? Why? <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's oh. wonderful. And oh. you thought I was being cruel to you. <laughs> Keeping no, people away not from cruel. You, making you a prisoner. <laughs> oh, you're the kindest man in the world. <laughs> I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. If I were not mad, I could have helped you. Whatever you had done, I could have pitied and protected you. But because I am mad, I hate you. Because I'm mad, I betrayed you. And because I am mad, I'm rejoicing in my heart without a shred of pity, without a shred of regret. Watching you go with glory in my heart. Probably before anything, we should like say what the definition is, right? Yeah. <laughs> um, if it's all right with you, can can I uh, read something um, that I wrote? Gaslighting is a highly manipulative, covert interactional strategy that enables a person to gain power and control over another one by systematically and methodically brainwashing them into believing they are personally, psychologically, 
physically and socially incompetent. It begins with the implantation of a problem, weakness, and or a mental health concern that either never existed or was only moderate or a benign problem. By an array of manipulative strategies, the psychological savvy gaslighter lures his unsuspecting victim into, an ex into experiencing the symptoms of a problem or conditions he insists his partner has, of which the gas-lit person was not previously aware. Through systematic manipulation of the victim's external environment and mental health, the, gas, the implanted gaslit condition begins to take root and eventually manifests. When displaying the gaslit condition, the gas lighter overemphasizes its negative impact on him, the victim, and people with whom the gaslit individual might come in contact. Over time, the victim identifies with the problem and feels powerless to control it. The resulting feelings of powerlessness, which are often combined with fear, anxiety, and paranoia, renders the gaslit victim powerless over the implanted problem. Feeling powerless, the victim becomes susceptible to the gaslighter's plan to isolate them from others who could possibly expose the gaslighter's um, nefarious and malignant um, plan. So wh what are your thoughts, or wh what else would you like to add to help um, our viewers understand more of, of what gaslighting is? So I usually describe it as a covert, aggressive way of distorting or controlling a person's perception of reality. And that ends up leading people into self-doubt, into confusion, into feeling like they're crazy, feeling paranoid about everything. They lose sense of reality. And then usually when I talk to the survivors, they're telling me, but I really think it was me and maybe something's really wrong with me and maybe I'm really everything he said or she said that I was. But gaslighters um, are narcissistic. You know, I talk a lot about narcissistic abuse, the human magnet syndrome, and, and, this, and people with self-love deficit disorder and codependency's susceptibility to narcissists. And uh, when I was first trying to figure out how it plays out in the human magnet syndrome, uh, driven relationship, I was thinking of narcissists. And it came to me that the gaslighter um, is um, sociopathic. And if they're not sociopathic, they have um, the type of narcissism that has sociopathic traits, mm -hmm. like malignant, narcissist, n malignant narcissism or, or covert narcissism. D do you see, what, what, is, what do you see as the connection between um, sociopathy and gaslighting? So I've had that same sort of feeling ever since I read or heard Dr. Martha Stout's book on, on YouTube. I started realizing, like especially when I confronted my mom, that actually looks like more sociopathic tendency because it's very conscious. It's like right. sadistic. They're doing it intentionally. It's not, they're unaware of it. So when I've noticed this in people, I've had that same suspicion. Maybe this is what they call that comorbidity, you know, right. where they're, they're exhibiting sociopathic tendencies, but they could be another form of cluster B predominantly. It, it seems to me that um, someone with gaslighting almost requires to have little to no empathy. Right. Um, and my experience is narcissists, and a lot of people who've been abused by narcissists, they say the narcissist has no empathy, but it's not true. The narcissist has empathy for people with whom they love which requires that person to take care of them. So they love the people that love them, and they have empathy. Huh. But it seems to me that the, the, the gaslighter um, doesn't have empathy, and it needs to be almost hollow inside to do some of the things that it's required. Uh, do, you, do, do, you, do you see that that's too? That's interesting. Yeah, in fact, Dr. Stout talks about that in her book. She says that the conscience the human conscience is related to empathy, love, human attachments, right. and whatnot, and, and compassion. So if their conscience doesn't work, or it's very malformed, or something happened to it, then they don't have that empathy, and it's much easier for them to manipulate other people. So it makes a lot of sense that the, the gaslighters um, are psychopathic or sociopathic, or the term that we use in the psychological field is, has, is antisocial personality disorder. But I, but I want to add that um, you can be have narcissistic personality disorder, and um, and have it manifest as um, what many of us call covert narcissism, or the uh, narcissist that pretends to be loving 
giving and kind and survives by um, the perfection of their outer role. But inside, um, they're extremely narcissistic. Um, so the covert narcissist has a little bit of psychopathy or soci sociopathy um, because they're hiding their narcissism um, and pretending to be someone else. And then you have the, the malignant narcissist and uh, who is um, a little bit more paranoid and vicious. And, and I don't want to go into those because I have uh, YouTube videos on, on, on both, um, both topics. Do you think that someone with a borderline personality disorder um, could, uh, could, or could be a gaslighter? Probably. Maybe it depends what other comorbidity that they have. You know, like I always suspected my mom had more of the borderline, but when I actually confronted her on it, then I really saw the sociopathic traits come out and how excited she was about gaslighting. That was like the whoa moment for me. We both know this, you know, the human magnet syndrome, uh, um, the codependent needs the narcissist or the pathological right. narcissist. And so, I mean, your dad, if your mom was a gaslighter or if your mom right. was a pathological narcissist, um, they can't exist um, by themselves. They need someone right. else. But, but it's interesting because now that I've been really formulating my ideas on gaslighting and working with my clients on them, um, I'm starting to see it more and more um, in people's memories of their childhood. My SLD clients or my codependent uh, clients, when they talk about um, trying to like adapt to try um, to their narcissistic parent who never loved them just for who they were, they eventually were molded into the version that their parent wanted or needed, and they had to deny their own self and be the person that made their narcissistic parent happy. And that's that's the the the, the beginning, um, the 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 seeds that are eventually going to become codependency. That's a form of gaslighting because if you're a child and the only way that you ever feel like you're lovable is be, is if you make the narcissist happy or you do things that don't piss them off right or you're this high low maintenance kid you start to believe that you are this broken person is you and there's no way out of it I think you're totally right. You know, you were talking about how the child learns that his or her needs and feelings and emotions and perceptions of reality are not valid. Right. They're not important. They're not valid. They're dismissed. They're put down. They're shamed. They're whatever. And so they start to believe that, and that becomes part of the definition of the sense of self, right. which is devastating. Yeah, that's funny that you say that. What I hear over and over again from a lot of clients is that their ex-partner or whomever was accusing them of being bipolar, for right. example. Why? Because they were on the emotional roller coaster. Right. That's the way the abuse went. They brought him up. They brought him down. And so naturally their emotions were tethered to whatever gaslighting you know the abuser was doing. But then the person at the end started thinking something really must be wrong with me because my emotions really are going like this. But they don't realize it's a result of the abuse. And... So, so you take that and you put that onto a child who is, doesn't know any better. I mean, the, 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 gaslit, the gaslit adult victim doesn't know any better. They're right. generally, you know, they start off codependent. They have low self-esteem. They have self-love deficit disorder. But the child um, doesn't know any better. And after a while, when you tell a child he's stupid, um, when he doesn't do the right thing for mommy as a narcissist, right he starts to realize that who he really is isn't true it's a it's he's a good person he's a good person when he sacrifices himself and takes care of others and to me i mean that type of gaslighting is is probably um the most uh, severe because you grow up with it and you don't even know it right have you and all of all of your self-worth gets wrapped up in that role that you're playing. You know, the caretaker, the healer, the therapist, whatever role you're playing to listen to or fix mom or dad, like all of your self-worth gets caught up in there. And that's why people take that codependency into relationships and they feel like, well, if I just do this for this person, then I'll have worth and they'll love me and I'll get love in return, that conditional love. Yeah, it's, it's, it, you, you, become, <clears throat> you become the human doing. I mean, you're, you're, yeah. so that's the gaslit condition is you identify that you are a good person when you sacrifice, 
when you right. listen to people that talk too much, when you forgive someone who's always breaking promises, um, when you are patient with someone who has no intention of ever giving you anything, the narcissist. Right. And you, th you identify, well, that's who you are and that's good because you were gaslit as a child. We have to go through tons of therapy um, as an adult to like deprogram ourselves from that brainwashing. What, what helped you to break free from the gaslit persona? That for me, um, it was the insecure. Um, I, I used to believe I was ugly. I used to believe that I wasn't smart. Um, and I used to believe that I was unlovable. And, um, and I had very little, few friends. How, how did you break free from your own childhood gaslighting? For me, I think it was about reestablishing my connection with my intuition, rebuilding the sense of self-trust, because I think that's the damage that's done by gaslighting, is you lose your sense of self-trust, you put that trust in other people, you look for approval outside or people pleasing outside of you to get that somewhere outside of you. So bringing that back within, really fully trusting my intuition, because I knew every time, and maybe you can relate to that too, as an adult at least, you knew when someone was gaslighting you, even if you didn't know the term gaslighting, exactly. there was some intuitive feeling, even That's like the gut level, you knew, but you overrode that, taking what that person was saying for truth instead. That, that, that is so cool that you brought up because what, 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 that, what that says is that even the person with a pretty severe case of self-love deficit disorder, there's still a part of them that has some level of, of consciousness of the craziness and and I think because SLDs or codependents do not have a personality disorder and and they can actually feel you know, um, and know what's wrong with them I think when you get that trigger or that, that that idea that this doesn't feel right but you choose to go with the gaslighting I think that that really speaks to the power of and the insidiousness of the, the, the gaslighting itself, that it can override right. our mental psychological systems. Right, and it, it almost seems like the more noble choice, that's what I realized. It was like when the choice is, do you believe yourself or do you believe the person you love? Right. Right, it looks like the more noble choice to self-sacrifice and believe the person that you love. And I realized that was the danger right there. And I vowed to myself, I'm never ignoring that intuition again. I don't care if I don't have proof in the rational world, I'm going to listen to that feeling because that feeling doesn't lie. Right. And, and, and what, you're, what you're saying is actually establishing validity of why I changed the, the, the name codependency to self-love deficit disorder. Because codependency or SLDD can only exist if you don't have self-love. Right. It's it's as simple as that, and and I'm at, and if you don't and you haven't learned to love yourself, then you don't have the inner drive, the inner strength, the inner resilience, um, and fearlessness to respond to that that instinct or, or um, that you and I talked about, and set a boundary to the person that is gaslighting you you right. naturally and almost reflexively, you just kind of fall back into the gaslighting. And, and you have been gaslit to be powerless. Right. And you change that um, by helping someone find self-love. Have, have you ever in your, in your um, coaching practice um, worked with someone who uh, was gaslit and helped them overcome that and if so, um, what was your experience? I think probably everybody that I've worked with was gaslit because they all come with these feelings of, I really need validation. Was it me? What's wrong with me? You know, what's going on? Because they told me, I'm an awful person. I'm a terrible mother. I'm a terrible wife or I'm a horrible husband or like they, all these ideas that they thought that they were. And so working with them on that, and I, I focus on the self-trust piece, you know, and I tell them, like, your mind can lie and your heart can lie. The mind can get caught up in all kinds of illusions and doubts, right. and the heart can get caught up in all kinds of fantasies and what we want right. to believe, but the body doesn't lie. 
And that primal gut level of intuition comes from the body, you know. So I tell people, think back to the beginning. Think back to when you knew something wasn't right, but you didn't trust yourself. What was your body doing? You know, and people often say, oh, something in my stomach. You know, I can't right. describe it. It was something in my stomach or I felt this weird thing in my legs or I just started to feel this, like, anxiety in my chest. I'm like, that's your body warning you. Now you know. When you feel that, you have to trust that. So... I'm going to, I feel like I'm poker. I'm going to take what you said and raise it. Okay. <laughs> in other words, I, when, uh, when my clients get to that point that you're talking about, and you, that was perfectly articulated, um, I then identify that the feeling in the body is actually um, the, um, the, the, the trauma that um, has been rendered unconscious through through repression, the trauma that is not remembered, um, and is, and what we do through a complicated set of psychological techniques is we identify that feeling is the child that they used to be, what I call the trauma child, um, and we give that child a voice, because, as a repressed memory, you can't get to the, you can't get to what happened. But the body is, is independent from the memory systems. And when they have that feeling in the stomach, then we start talking about um, um, the child that they used to be, and they try to, and I get them to remember that child and what they went through, and they connect these newly conscious memories um, to the body sensation, and that is when there's an explosion of, uh, of of affect, and it, it's a connection that is bar none some of the deepest responses that my clients can get. Um, and that moment, the body and the memories come together, and their the trauma is integrated. In fact, um, it's, I, um, I I just created um, a training that's available uh, on my website, Advanced Clinical Trainers, and it's called um, um, Healing the Trauma Child Technique. That actually spends about three hours going over how I do this. But it's so cool that you and I get to the same spot and you through your own skill set and your own wisdom help them move forward and and become less a victim of um, of, of of that unconscious part of gaslighting. So what do you what do you think of what I just said? What are your thoughts about it or feedback? That's awesome. So when you were talking about the body, I was thinking about Dr. Joe Dispenza. I think he might be a biologist or something like that. He's some sort of scientist, but he talks about how the body is the subconscious. So like the body is storing the trauma at a cellular level. And, and that's why we, we manifest all these psychosomatic illnesses sometimes because that trauma is stored in the body. And so maybe that's connected to what you're talking about, the body's memory. You know, the stomach happens because something happened when you were growing up. And you've just kept that there inside the memory, the trauma. I, I've actually heard of that, and I've actually um, read some research where actually they've identified certain cells in different parts of the body, including the stomach, that actually are connected to memory. Wow. But as much as I um, and as much as I say I understand that and agree, I still believe something different. I believe that the trauma, um, and this is PTSD really, um, the trauma that is experienced as a child, having a narcissistic parent is so severe um, that they have to repress it. And they right. repress it in the part of the brain called the limbic system, or specifically the amygdala. And the amygdala is not connected to uh, the conscious memory systems. It, um, the conscious memory systems are actually connected to the cerebral cortex. And so if we try to remember something, we have to find those memory networks, and that's how our regular memories work. But trauma is stored in the, um, the amygdala, it registers feelings, it registers uh, sensations. So if you have PTSD, and which the trauma was so bad, you can't remember it. Say you saw someone shot in front of you, you're a war a veteran or whatever, you can't remember it because your mind has closed it off for you for your own survival, but you're going to get a sensation. You're gonna get anxiety, you're gonna have, you might faint, you might have a panic attack. You might, and and so the PTSD is alive through other symptomology. 
But people who have PTSD will talk about sensations that they have and they can't make the connection because the memory is locked away. So when my clients, um, I actually try to get them to identify the feeling in their body. Um, I actually suggest that to them before they say it to me. I use the body sensations as a way to connect them or open the door to the memories that have been repressed to um, integrate those. So I think, I believe I am right, and I believe the information you said is right, um, um, that the body sensations might be independent, but I also think they are the, the only part that the, uh, the amygdala or the limbic system allows to get out are sensations. Do I don't think, think we I don't think we disagree. I think we're on the same page. It's all connected, is what I'm saying too. I don't think it's separate. Um, I mean, we want people to understand our body is the first clue to our trauma. Um, so going back to gaslighting. <laughs> In general, for dealing with gaslighting, I think the primary thing to focus on is the self trust. It's rebuilding that self trust, which is so damaged from the gaslighting, and I right. think that starts with reconnecting with the intuition, that psychosomatic connection, feeling your body, feeling the messages of your body, how is that related to your psychology, right. and trusting that first and foremost. I like that, self-trust. If you can't trust yourself, then how can you get better? How do you know who to trust or what to trust either? I, I love to create models and theories, but I actually have a nine-step um, um, treatment um, theory or um, treatment um, model of self-love deficit disorder recovery. And the very first step is hitting bottom. But I, you know, I, you know, what I'm hearing you say is bottom is when you just have to trust how you feel is real. And, and you, for just a minute, you break free from the gas, the gaslighting oblivion. Right. You know, you were talking about the repressed memories from the PTSD. So maybe the more you trust yourself, the more those memories can start coming forth, that you can process them and move beyond them. And, and I think the trust is like, I mean, that's the magic moment in our work is when we can like, you know, when I work with someone or you work with someone is, is for the first time where we just validate that all the shit that they've gone through and all the stuff real. is real. And they, you know, me, we might be the first person that says, right. you have been totally, totally, <laughs> I'm going to make this rated G, screwed with. Right. <laughs> how, how does that work for you? I mean, how does that play out for you at that moment of what I would call hitting bottom? So I think it's the same thing you're talking about is the very first thing they want to talk about is like they need that validation. Like, just please tell me what's real here because I don't know what to believe anymore. And it's like that's so relieving for them that then they can really fully move, start to move through the, the healing journey. But until they get that, there's still so much self-doubt. They still feel like it's all their fault or something's really wrong with them or maybe they were responsible for all of that. Tell, tell our, our viewers um, how successful you are at getting them to understand that and what happens from that. Because I know about your work, but I, I don't think a lot of my, my YouTube viewers know about it. Yeah, I usually just give them the feedback. Like I point out this and that and the other and I tell them like that's textbook, it's so common. Really, that's common? Yes, it's so common. And then I usually make some kind of joke, you know, that right. helps relax people and opens their heart a little bit and then they start to relax and start to trust that it's not their fault. You know, and I think the, the next big piece is to understand that it's not your fault, but you can change it and you have to take the self-responsibility to transform yourself so that you don't continue to live in that way. There's no coincidence that, you know, um, we immediately connected. It seems like we're on the same page and we do similar, um, we, we do similar type of healing even though we have our own background. My goal is to give them an opportunity to look into a, a mirror that shows for the first time themselves, not, I mean, if they were gaslit, um, someone took a picture that they wanted them to look like and they put it on a mirror and they said, this is what you look like. This is the mirror. Um, and every time they looked in the mirror, they saw that picture. 
And so they identified with themselves as the narcissist or the gaslighter wanted, to, wanted them to. I think what you and I do for the very first time is we peel off <laughs> that picture and we say, this is who you are and she's perfect. And, and we help them see who they are and learn to love that person. What I notice is that this enormous amount of relief, like I can, I can feel it, I can see it in their face, we're working on Skype, I can just see that they are so relieved that someone is validating them. So, so you know, we've been talking about gaslighting on the individual level, on the familial level, and I see also how it applies to the societal level, like we look at mainstream media, entertainment, government, politicians, even the collective culture of, as you described, dumbing things down. In fact, we talked about the movie Idiocracy. I'm the smartest guy in the world? Says who? The IQ test you took in prison. You got the highest score in history. Even smarter than President Camacho. Ladies and gentlemen, the President of America! In the year 2505. We got this guy. He's gonna fix everything. So you smart. The ordinary will be considered extraordinary. I thought your hair would be bigger. Idiocracy. For the smartest guy in the world, you're pretty dumb sometimes. I think it's kind of alarming where we're at right now in society. I'm curious what your feelings are on that. Well, I'm so glad you brought that up because this whole presidential um, election and the results of that have um, given me very strong opinions on how politicians can um, win elections by manipulating um, the emotions of people getting them to be afraid of problems that don't exist, that aren't really big problems, but, but um, they, they methodically and with great calculation um, try to incite fear and anxiety and paranoia and then portray themselves as the person that can save them. That's gaslighting. In fact, I have this video um, out on YouTube and it's called How Trump Stole America. Um, where I talk about that just exclusively. Um, and so this is just a coincidence, but my wife um, started to read the book 1984, which nice. is my favorite book by George Orwell, and it hit me just a couple of nights ago. It's about gaslighting. I mean, the whole story is about the, the society getting um, the masses, the people to believe whatever the truth is um, and and if they have to change the truth, then they manipulate the society through fear, anxiety, and punishment. I definitely think it's a it's it's a societal problem. What 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 do you think? I totally agree. And I also would say on the flip side, gaslighting is used for everything's okay, just like in the family. Nothing's happening here. Right. Don't look at that. You know, and there was a lot of that too. I think it works on both sides. One is just a lot more covert and the other is a lot more overt. Fear, fear, fear. So I'm thinking of by what you said, it made me think of the nineteen fifties when um, Everyone, of course, I wasn't alive, nor were you, <laughs> but um, everyone, everyone was happy and everything was going well. No one talked about problems. Everyone, you know, it was, um, it was this whole uh, societal denial. Um, and, and that's kind of what I'm hearing you say is, right. is, is to believe everything is good when, and to deny the background problems that are real. Right. 
I mean, th I mean, maybe that's how the. Co I mean, I'm, I'm not a, I'm not a politi I'm not a um, political science person or historian, but one could say, you know, that's how communism um, or um, dictatorships um, took control over their societies, their countries. Right, they're gaslighting, and when you look at what's going on right now, it starts to look really similar. And I think it's been it's been moving quietly and slowly that way, probably for at least 15 years. Just yep. slowly by slowly, civil rights have been quietly taken away. Bills have been passed. Things have been stuffed in bills and nobody looks at, like, the fine print and what's happening. And before we know it, this dictator's toolkit is handed to Donald Trump. And let's see what happens now. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> I'd like to end with a really disturbing <laughs> realization that is going to ruin a lot of people's childhood memories. So I want to end on a happy note here. Um, that perhaps the, the best uh, depiction of gaslighting was in The Wizard of Oz. Right. And you know, this favorite movie we had, The Wizard of Oz, who was nothing more than a, a short, kind of feeble, weak-looking guy, hid behind a curtain and was able to make people believe he was much stronger and much more omniscient and omnip omnipotent and he got the he got the lion to believe he had no courage, and he always had courage. He got the scarecrow to believe he had no brains, and that tin man to no heart. And and as long as he got those people to believe what they didn't have, he had complete control over them. Right. And, and the movie ends when they find out they were all kind of gaslit, and the wizard was really <laughs> nothing but a a, um, a bully coward. Um, so do you think I'm causing any psychological damage to our viewers by taking away? No, I, I, think, it, I think it's good to bring that up. Well, tell, before we close, to tell people how they can learn more about you and uh, where they can uh, find your services. You can find me on YouTube, Inner Integration. You can also find my website, innerintegration.com. I've got trainings there, digital download trainings. I just came out with a new one on self-care mastery course. Mm -hmm. That's fantastic. It comes with eight bonus, um, eight bonus audios, which are exercises and guided visualizations, the most common exercises that I teach. And you can listen to my videos for free anytime on YouTube as well. Okay. And you have a uh, thriving um, a personal coaching business, if I, I do, and uh, I've heard great things about that. Um, me, um, well, you know about my YouTube video if you're watching this. Uh, you know about my YouTube channel if you're watching this video, um, and so you know kind of a little bit about me and my specialties. Um, I also wrote the book, The Human Magnet Syndrome: Why We Love People Who Hurt Us. I um, am a professional trainer, and all of my trainings are now. Um, in uh, video format um, on my website, advancedclinicaltrainers.com. Um, and I'm constantly um, building that library. So uh, my videos, for f I have free video clips that are available um, on YouTube, and I have the whole um, video seminars, which are up to six hours there. I'm also a psychotherapist. I own Clinical Care Consultants, a counseling center in Arlington Heights, Illinois, and Inverness, Illinois. And um, a couple other things. I mean, every day um, I find another project um, to get into. And, of course, my wife keeps telling me, no, stop. <laughs> but life is fun. Well, before we kind of sign out, um, let me tell um, um, our folks about um, a webinar I'm having. Um, and guess what it's on? I'll give you one guess. <laughs> it Gaslighting? Is Gaslighting, <laughs> yes. You are really smart. I am doing a three-hour gaslighting seminar. Yes, three hours, a lot of information. Uh, gaslighting seminar um, um, on February 25th. It's February 25th at 12 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Now, because this YouTube video is going to be up for a while, um, it is 2017. <laughs> it's funny because I did a video with uh, Lisa Romano, and we did a training in February um, in 2014 and every January I get a couple emails saying they want to sign up to that um, that webinar <laughs> <laughs> so thank you oh my gosh I have such a great time chatting with you and the viewers don't know we chatted for like 45 minutes before we even started the video you're awesome I hope to do this again and until then I wish you the very best thank you so much for all of your time and input today Ross well thanks okay bye <laughs>